Hello everyone, my name is Mike Filio. I'm a pre-hospital care specialist with the Southwestern Ontario Regional Base Hospital Program. Today I'll be presenting you with an overview of tracheostomy emergencies, which will include some flowcharts and clinical case studies. Before we start, I'd like to thank my co-author Kate Oliver May. Kate is a respiratory therapist, researcher, and educator that loaned us some of her talents for this webinar. To assist you in your learning, we have included some downloadable and printable resources that can be found on the main page of this webinar. Without further ado, let's get started. So our learning objectives today is we're going to look at the standard anatomy. We're going to look at trach tubes, different styles and sizes. We're going to look at the standard and emergency care that's associated with some of these patients. We're going to look at our medical directives and the application of some of these with our clinical cases. So when we look at the normal airway anatomy, and just think about breathing, first it starts at our nares. It works through the sinuses, through the nasal and oral pharynx, where most of the air is clean and humidified. The air then passes through the epiglottis, making way to our vocal cords, thyroid, cricoid, and tracheal cartilages. The trachea then divides into the carina, into the right and left main bronchus, eventually subdividing into our secondary and tertiary bronchiolus. During inspiration, our intercostal muscles and diaphragms contract, causing change in pressure within the thorax. This increases the chest wall size, decreasing the internal pressure. This causes air to rush into the lungs to try to equalize the pressure. When we exhale, the diaphragm and intercostal muscles actually just relax, and this actually increases the amount of pressure, forcing air out of the lungs. Our breathing rate is controlled by something called the chemoreceptors within the brain and main arteries, specifically in the aorta and carotid artery. They monitor oxygen and carbon dioxide within the blood, and off Often when oxygen saturations fall, uh, ventilations accelerate to try to compensate for the increased demand. The same is with carbon dioxide. If it increases within the blood, this shifts the pH and also causes an increase in respirations to hopefully send the body back to homeostasis. One of the first recorded tracheostomies was performed due to an upper airway obstruction. And this is still one of the classic findings today. You can see tracheostomies performed for several reasons. Uh, some of them can include securing and maintenance of the airway with certain facial head or neck injuries, um, following certain types of surgeries, uh, bronchial hygiene where people have a poor coughing effort or increased sputum retention, protection of the airway with people who are high risk of aspiration and various diseases that are associated with that, or patients that need long-term ventilation that can be found in hospitals or even communities. They can be temporary, or this can be a long-term and permanent adventure for them. You can kind of see on these diagrams, pre and post tracheostomy. With laryngectomy patients, the larynx usually is involved with some form of cancer, and this involves a complete surgical removal of the larynx, which disconnects the upper airways from the lungs themselves. This is a permanent and irreversible procedure. The trachea is transected and then actually sutured to the anterior portion of the neck. Once this has been performed, the patient will never be able to breathe, oxygenate, or even ventilate from the upper airways again. Tubes are sometimes inserted in the laryngectomy stomas, especially when they have just been created. If the patient needs invasive ventilation or requires repeat suctioning, the most common Tubes are shorter and non-cuffed. Once well established, the patient will not need a tube in place, but it's still common to see speaking valves, HMEs, or even protective clothing like bibs. Looking at the pathway of airflow, a tracheostomy patient, we're able to actually ventilate them depending if we have a trach tube in place and if there's a cuff through the oral pharynx, as, as well as the stoma. With a laryngectomy patient, we can never ventilate them via the oral pharynx, purely and only the stoma. And that is the most important difference between the two types of patients. Let's talk about trach tubes and the different components that we see with them. 
We have a neck flange and plate, and there's some very important information that's associated with this. You can find the inner diameter, outer diameter, uh, sizes, if they're fenestrated, and if there's an inner lumen, kind of like a fact sheet right in front of it. We also have the outer cannula, which is uh, predominantly what's always going to be in place. And this one happens to be cuffed. You can see that because there's a pilot balloon. The connector is on the end of the inner cannula. And sometimes this needs to be in place because it's the only 15 millimeter adapter. This tube happens to be fenestrated, which we'll cover in a bit. And there, here's the obturator, which is what's going to help you facilitate and put this in place. Looking at cuff tubes, there's many different types. What's important to mention about cuff tubes is that they're essential for any type of positive pressure ventilation. Obstructions of this cuff tracheostomy tube would be potentially life-threatening, so any time you have a cuff tube, it's essential that they have a dual cannula in place. That's because the patency of this is essential. An inner cannula can easily be removed and replaced. That's why we like to have one in place. An uncuffed tube is for people that are kind of ongoing and they've been in the community for a long time and they're most likely long-term patients that need to clear secretions or need to keep their airway patent. These tubes will not allow for effective positive pressure ventilation and you need to keep this in mind. So you may need to ventilate from above and below and try different options. Even for oxygenation, you may actually require oxygen masks on the oral pharynx and at the stoma itself. Now, with these types of patients, we talked about obstructions and just weird airway anatomy. That may require a specialty type of tracheostomy tube. You're going to be informed when you get there. Unfortunately, we're not going to know every single type of tube, but it's important for you to know that they're out there. And of course, with every airway, there's pediatric airways. It's essential that you know that these are out there as well. Tube accessories are very common. Here you can actually see some disposable inner cannulas with 15 millimeters adapters on top of them. You can see decannulation caps, which would be in place for people that are trying to eventually get to breathe out of their normal airway structures. And they're all part of tracheostomy tube accessories. Here we have a speaking valve, which is a one-way valve that only allows for inspiration. This is because it forces the air to go up through the normal glottic opening and allowing them to speak through their vocal cords. It's essential to know that you can't have an inflated cuff in place because it won't allow this patient to ventilate. And of course, we have heat moisture exchange valves. These help to keep the vital moisture inside of the lungs instead of blowing it off and increasing that tenacious thick secretions that often cause airway obstructions. And of course, anyone that's on a ventilator or has any type of supplemental oxygen will most likely have a filter in place as well. I'm sure we're all familiar with these. Now that we're familiar with some of the anatomy changes associated with tracheostomy and laryngectomy patients, some of the indications of why they may have those things in place, as well as the equipment, different types of trach tubes, accessories, and so on, we're gonna go ahead and, and take a deeper look into our medical directive. So this is endotracheal and tracheostomy suctioning. This can be provided by a primary care or an advanced care paramedic, and the indications are a patient with an endotracheal or tracheostomy tube. They also have to have an airway obstruction or increased secretions, and there's no conditions or contraindications that need to be met. The treatment is very specific. For an infant, we need to set our suction at 60 to 100 millimeters of mercury. For a child, we need to set the suction at 100 to 120. And for an adult, we need to set it at 100 to 150 millimeters of mercury. There is one minute intervals and a max of five doses. It's very important to pre-oxygenate your patient, let them know what you're doing at all times, and do not exceed 10 seconds while suctioning. For sizing, we're gonna use French catheters. And to do that, you're gonna take the inner diameter of the 
uh, trig tube that's in front of you, you're gonna times it by two, and that will be your French catheter, or at least the very max for your service provider. So as, as an example, uh, seven inner diameter, we're gonna times it by two, and the maximum you would use is a 14 French catheter. The tracheostomy tube reinsertion medical directive is for a primary care or advanced care paramedic. The indications are a patient with an existing tracheostomy where the inner and or outer cannulas have been removed from the airway, there's respiratory distress, an inability to adequately ventilate, and there's no family member or caregiver who is available and or knowledgeable to replace the tracheostomy cannula. There's no indications for this, but there are some contraindications, and that's the inability to landmark or visualize. Treatment is a maximum of two attempts, and reinsertion is defined as the insertion of a cannula into the tracheostomy. We always prefer new as opposed to clean tracheostomy tubes. So try to keep that in mind. Okay, now that we've reviewed our medical directives and we're up to date on all of those, we're gonna go through some of our clinical cases. Now, if you don't have your flowchart out yet or you don't have a copy of it, now's a good time to press pause and get that ready. You're really gonna want that to work through some of these clinical cases. Okay, so we're being called code four for a 64-year-old female at her home complaining of shortness of breath. Upon arrival at the residence, you're met by the patient's family located at the front door. The husband introduces himself as Rob and leads you into the living room of their home. Entering the room, you find an elderly woman sitting upright in her hospital bed, mildly distressed and short of breath. Rob explains that he's the primary caregiver and feels something is wrong with his wife, Joni. Now, Rob states that Joni is on a ventilator at night to help assist with her breathing and then is taken off in the morning. Rob informs you that today the ventilator was removed and Joni was not ready to wake up. She was very pale and slow to respond. Rob feels that his wife, Joni, needs to be assessed at a hospital for a shortness of breath and increased weakness. Now, following your initial scene size up, you're gonna start getting your sample history. Joni has a past medical history of an MVC five years prior, causing a spinal cord injury at C5, hypertension, and high cholesterol. Your physical assessment reveals that she's roughly 50 kilograms and has a patent oral airway with a trach tube present. It's cuffed and has an inner cannula that's 7.5 millimeters. There's small amounts of dark and dry secretions located around the flange, and you note accessory muscle use and labor respirations. Your auscultation reveals fine crackles in the bases of her lungs, and you can see the typical atrophy that you would expect from someone like her. There's poor skin turgor, and she has a fully catheter in place with small amounts of urine. Her vital signs, heart rate 124, respiratory rate of 22, her BP is 108 over 55, her SATs are at 88, has a full GCS of 15, but a temperature of 38.4 degrees Celsius. Her blood glucose level is 9.8 and an end title of 48. Your EKG reveals sinus tac with PVCs. No known allergies and her medication list is provided for you. Okay, so this looks like it's shaping up to be a pretty interesting case. So we're going to refer to our tracheostomy emergency flow chart. Now we're going to start right in the middle and if you haven't already done so, we want to apply PPE, look, listen, and feel for breathing. Apply oxygen, SpO2, end tidal, cardiac monitor, and we want to assess our patient for respiratory distress that requires some type of intervention. Now in the case of Joni, we haven't applied oxygen yet, so we're going to go ahead and do that. Now here's several examples of different people with tracheostomies in place that require oxygenation. Now our first is someone that has a tracheostomy with a cuff. Now if they have a cuff, we're most likely fine to just go ahead and oxygenate the stoma. Now number two is someone that may have an uncuffed tracheostomy tube, um, and that's an example three as well. Now four 
that's someone that we're trying to hyperoxygenate and get them ready for ventilations. Now looking at this diagram, this is a great example of why we sometimes need to oxygenate both the stoma and oral pharynx of tracheostomy patients. The air will always take the path of least resistance. So you can see here to the left that we have someone with a cuff in place. Now someone that did not have a cuff trach tube, they could also be ventilated through the oral pharynx, as you can see right in the middle. Now sometimes people also have fenestrated tubes allowing for more air movement. This patient sounds extremely sick and may even have a respiratory infection, some dehydration, and may be well on her way to sepsis. So let's reevaluate our care as we bring her out into the ambulance. You notice that Joni's GCS and mentation start to drop to a GCS of nine. Her respiratory effort and oxygen saturation are decreasing as well. You think that she's gonna benefit from some positive pressure ventilations. So let's go ahead and refer back to our tracheostomy emergency flow chart. Now looking at our flow chart, we're gonna move from our beginning, which is look, listen, feel for breathing and applying our monitor and oxygen. And we're gonna do an intervention. So we're gonna to move to the right to ventilations. Now to first do that, we need to remove anything that might be in place. And that includes HMEs, speaking valves, inner cannulas, anything that might block the airway from us assessing or properly ventilating. And then we wanna see if there's actually a tube in place. Now with Joni, we have a tube and we have a cuff. So we're gonna go above and we're gonna go, yes, there's a cuff and we're gonna inflate it and we're gonna ventilate. So here's some examples of ventilation. Now one, this is someone that doesn't have a cuff and may just actually have a tracheostomy tube in place. It may be better to actually ventilate them from above in the oral pharynx because everything is gonna take the pathway of least resistance. Number two, this is someone who actually has a tracheostomy tube that was removed. So we're covering the stoma and trying to generate some pressure from above. Number three, now this is someone that had the trach tube removed and we're failing at ventilating them from above. So we're trying something else and attach the peed mask to the BVM and we're trying to ventilate them from the stoma. Number four, this is Joni's case where we actually have a cuff tube in place and we're gonna inflate it and we're gonna make sure we can ventilate properly. Now remember, it's very, very important when you have a tracheostomy patient to always assess the cuff and make sure it's inflated. Now, your most beneficial and best positive pressure ventilations are gonna be with an inflated cuff. Now, following your positive pressure ventilations, you're actually able to bring Joni's oxygen saturation back up to 94%. Now, this was an undiagnosed pneumonia that eventually progressed to sepsis. If you figured it out, or that's what you were thinking, then great job. We'll go on to the next case. Okay, everyone, if you don't have those flow charts out yet, it's time to go get them. Press pause and print them out. Now you're being called code four for a four-year-old female complaining of shortness of breath. Upon arrival at the residence, you're met by a frantic mother who keeps repeating, it came out and now she's panicking. You and your partner are led to a four-year-old female, Elizabeth, who's found on the couch of her home in severe respiratory distress. The frantic mother, Tammy, continues to explain that she was just in the middle of changing her daughter's trach tube and had to stop when Elizabeth began to have a coughing fit. Tammy informs you that Elizabeth was diagnosed with vocal cord dysfunction, or AKA PVCM, approximately one year ago. Tracheostomy tube was put in place two months ago for protection of her airway. However, Tammy informs you, this is my first time changing the tube without any help. Looking at Elizabeth, you can see it's anxious, agitated, and in respiratory distress. Tammy explains that she doesn't feel comfortable trying it again due to the horrible noise coming from Elizabeth. You look at your partner and ask, is that Strider? Following your scene sides up, you get your sample history and physical assessment. You find out that Elizabeth was diagnosed with VCD for which she had a tracheostomy tube put in place two months ago.
Your physical assessment reveals that Elizabeth is roughly 18 kilograms and in a right lateral position on the couch. She has a patent oral airway, a trach tube on the ground, which is uncuffed, and an inner cannula that has an ID of five millimeters. She has audible inspiratory and expiratory strider that can be heard and is also present on auscultation of the larynx and lungs. She has slight cyanosis and it's present around her lips and earlobes. Vital signs, heart rate 156, respiratory rate 40, BP 92 over 55. SpO2 is at 82%, her GCS is at 12. Temperature 37.1, BGL 4.9, end title 32, and EKG is sinus tack. There's no allergies and the medication list is I've found. Okay, this sounds like, again, it's shaping up to be an extremely complicated case. So wherever we can with pediatrics, we want to utilize the family to the best of our ability. In this case, Elizabeth's mother. Remember, we want to use the patient, then the family, and then us if we need to. You start, if you haven't already, to apply your PPE, look, listen, and feel for breathing. Apply oxygen, SpO2, ETCO2, cardiac monitor. Now we're assessing for respiratory distress that requires intervention. You feel that due to the circumstances that this patient actually needs ventilation. Unfortunately, your attempts at oxygenation and ventilation fail and we need to move to unable to ventilate and need for airway stabilization. One more thing that's important to note with pediatric patients is that may have very, very small uh, tracheostomy tubes that require catheter sizes that you may not carry. So make sure you look for any equipment that you can find on scene. In Elizabeth's case, she meets all the indications to move forward with this procedure. So first thing we're going to do is set ourselves up for success with proper positioning of our patient. Now you can see on the diagram that we have someone in a supine position and in a semi-sitting 45 degree angle. We want to hyperextend their neck and position something underneath their shoulders to do that. This is to help align all the anatomical structures. Let's take a minute and really stress the landmarking. Now, I really want to stress this point because if you look at the diagram in front of you, it really depicts the subcutaneous tissues very, very well. Now, it is possible with a fresh tracheostomy that these subcutaneous tissues can move, making it very, very difficult to landmark properly. Now, the risk that we run into with something like this is creating a false passage. Now, it's not as common to see these patients in the field with a fresh or not well-established tracheostomy, uh, but you may see something like this in a traumatic event where a tracheostomy tube has aggressively been pulled out. Now looking at this diagram, you can actually see on the left that there's a balloon holding the tracheostomy tube in place. Now this patient's very lucky because it's keeping it from moving into some of these structures. Now the tube on the right does not have a cuff that is inflated and was actually pushed into a false passage. Now the risk we run with this is that we've just created an airway obstruction and we're not actually ventilating our patient. You have to be extremely careful if you meet any type of resistance while trying to reinsert this tube. Now in Elizabeth's case, we know we need to work right and we need to reinsert this tracheostomy tube. So we've actually depicted this and we're just gonna run through it. So in one, we've set ourselves up for success with hyperangulating the neck. We're actually able to landmark and see the tracheostomy stoma. You can see our VVM for pre oxygenating the patient. We have an obturator in place and inside the outer cannula. And this is actually a Shiley. You'll see this very commonly out in the field. These are some of the most used types of trach tubes. What's important to note is with Shiley's, if they have an inner lumen, that's where your 15 millimeter adapter is. So this is what we need to put our end title on. We also have our to will ties ready to secure and we also have a 10 cc syringe ready to inflate the cuff. Number two, you can see the obturator in place and we're actually 
inserting the tracheostomy tube. Number three, you can see confirmation with our inner cannula being put in place and an optimal end tidal reading. And number four, you can see it's inflating the cuff and then we're going to secure the tube. Following your successful reinsertion of a tracheostomy tube, we're gonna go ahead and move to the successful chart. That means we're gonna inflate the cuff, confirm it's in place, and then we're gonna secure it. Don't let go of the tube until we secure it. We run the risk of possibly losing this valuable airway that we worked so hard to get. Now to secure it, you can see on the left here that we're just using standard to will ties, but there's several different ways of kind of making this secure with using the resources you have. On the right, you can see just some standard number breather oxygen ties that we fashion and use to tie around the flange. Now, there's other ways of possibly taping or using our nasal crike, uh, nasal cannula trick, which would also work. Um, you could use possibly some ETT tube securing ties or even King LT straps. Okay, so we're gonna conclude this case. Elizabeth was found in severe respiratory distress after her mother was trying to change her trach tube for the first time and was unsuccessful in securing the airway. Your attempts at oxygenation and ventilation failed, requiring you to move to reinsertion of a tracheostomy tube. You were provided with a brand new one and you were successful on your first attempt. You were able to properly oxygenate Elizabeth following the reinsertion and she was able to be transported to the closest pediatric center for follow-up. Great, very difficult case. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, this looks pretty interesting. Clinical case number three. If you don't have out your emergency flowcharts yet, now the time to press pause and go get it. You're called code four for one down. It's an MVC, car versus motorcycle, for a male possibly in his 60s. You hear from the dispatcher that he's traveling at approximately 80 kilometers an hour. You arrive on scene and start your initial survey. The area is secure, safe, and police have now taken over traffic control. The survey reveals only one male patient and approximately in his 60s. Bystanders explain that the patient tried to run a red light and was T-boned by oncoming traffic. The MVC took place two minutes prior to your arrival and no one knows your John Doe. You begin a rapid trauma assessment, which reveals multi-system trauma, possibly including a head injury. Upon further investigation, you find a medical alert bracelet stating laryngectomy. You update your dispatch center and inform them the trauma hospital that you will be transporting to their facility. Now looking at the medical alert bracelet and seeing laryngectomy, you're instantly looking at the patient's neck. You find a bib and underneath the bib, you find this HME valve. You can see that it's covering the laryngectomy and it's full of mucus. We are not actually able to obtain a full past medical history with this patient, but we know he has a laryngectomy in place. Our physical assessment shows John Doe is roughly 80 kilograms and laying supine. He has a patent oral airway no laryngectomy tube, but he has an HME valve present with copious amounts of secretions. A large amount of damage is noted to the helmet and you suspect a possible head injury. Obvious deformity to his left femur is present with an unstable pelvis. Other physical assessments are unremarkable. Vital signs are as followed. Heart rate 148, respirations 8, blood pressure 68 over 40, SpO2 is 68%, GCS3, temp 37.1, BGL 5.9, end tidal of 32, and EKG is sinus tac. There's no known allergies and no medications. Laryngectomy patients are approached very similar to tracheostomy patients, but there is one very big key difference. We are not able to ventilate via the oral pharynx and only via the stoma. So if we haven't done so already, we're gonna apply PPE, we're gonna look, listen, feel for breathing, we're gonna apply oxygen, SpO2, end tidal, and our cardiac monitor. We're gonna assess for respiratory distress and anything requiring in intervention. Now with this patient, we're probably gonna go down the ventilatory and suction pathway. 
So let's see what that looks like. Now, we know with this patient that we found an HME valve in place, which we've removed. But if we're following our flow chart down the ventilation pathway, we need to assess for speaking valves, inner cannulas that may be obstructed, and anything that's in the way or might get in the way of ventilations. In this airway, we know that there was a lot of mucus, so our partner is probably also prepping for suction. Now, if we continue down the flow chart, we need to assess for a tumid place. No, this laryngectomy patient, we didn't have one. So we're gonna go no, and we know that we cannot ventilate via the oral pharynx. So we're gonna cover the mouth and nose and ventilate via the stoma with an adult BVM and a peed mask. Now you can see this being attempted on the left side, and if we can hear any type of leaking at all, it is possibility that we could be losing some pressure. So we're gonna cover the nose and mouth and continue to ventilate. Now, we stated with this patient that you need to go ahead and prepare for suction because of the copious amounts of fluids and secretions that were found inside the HME valve. Now, you can see here that this patient actually has a seven inner diameter, so we times it by two, and we come up with a 14 French catheter for our max. We're actually measuring in between the two clavicular heads, which is about where the carina is, and we know that's the maximum depth that we're going to go. You can see this actually being inserted on the right side and we're going to go ahead and suction at 100 and start there. We have five attempts and we're going to suction for 10 seconds on the way out. Follow the flow chart and you can't go wrong. Now in the case of our laryngectomy patient, oral intubation is not on the emergency flow chart and that's because there's no actual connection between the oral pharynx and the trachea. Remember, all these structures have been removed and now the trachea has been stitched to the anterior portion of the neck. Still, this is an option after failure of ventilation with a tracheostomy patient, so we're still gonna cover it. So you can see in one that we've pre oxygenated our patient, we have our BVM out, we've sized up everything, and we're gonna use a bougie to help facilitate this tube. In two, you can see the bougie being passed and in three, you can see us railroading over the tube. Now in four, we're confirming placement and we've secured the tube in place. In the case of our laryngectomy patient, we're facing impeding respiratory failure. And that's because of the copious amounts of secretion and the inability to properly ventilate or oxygenate this patient. So if we're following our laryngectomy flow chart, we're actually gonna move after a failed attempt at a tracheostomy tube, which is not in place, or laryngectomy tube, we're actually gonna to move to stoma intubation. And that's gonna be with a six inner diameter ETT tube. So all the same principles apply. You can see in one that we're pre oxygenating our patient here, and in two, we're actually using a bougie to help facilitate this intubation. In three, we're railroading over the bougie and we're using the six tube. And in four, we're inflating the tube and the cuff. Now, you don't wanna let go, remember we've talked about this, you don't wanna let go of that until we properly secure it. So in conclusion, we're gonna wrap up this case. You found one unconscious John Doe, he's been involved in an MVC, and he has a lot of traumatic injuries and possibly a head injury. You removed his bib, you found an HME valve, and begin ventilating and suctioning the airway. Despite your best attempts, oxygenation and ventilation was a failure and you needed further airway stabilization and the stoma was intubated. The procedure was successful and continuous ventilation and deep suction was provided en route to the hospital. The rest of the patient's injuries were treated en route and your patient arrived alive at the trauma center. Great job again. Okay, everyone, that's the end of our clinical cases. Thank you for joining us today. We really got to thank Kate Oliver May for lending us some of her expertise. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we hope that uh, you had a good time. So in conclusion, we reviewed some of the anatomy, the different trach tubes, sizes, and components, some of the standard emergency care and, and uh, the medical directives that are associated with this, and we applied it to some of the clinical cases. Here's some of our references. You're more than welcome to check them out.
And if you have any questions, drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for joining us today. See you next time.